You're listening to the Huddle Up Podcast with Chad Jensen and Zach Kelberman. Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com and sound off. And now it's time to drop some knowledge. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up Podcast, presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. We are coming to you from the Vivid Seat Studio. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, and with me, as always, my partner in crime. You know him. You love him as the lead NFL writer for Heavy.com. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, the reverberations are still echoing through Broncos country. Bradley Chubb, officially placed on IR. His season is done. Yeah, it's... uh it's a sad, strange, you know, ending to a pre- very premature sophomore year. We talked about in the last pod that it sucks for Bradley Chubb personally, and it sucks for the Broncos defense as a whole. But, um, you know, he's looking like he's re- he's taking the rehab really strong. He's attacking it really strong. And uh, knowing him and his work ethic, I think he'll be fully healthy well in time for the 2020 season. And fortunately, these, you know, these injuries, these ACLs, they aren't as severe as in years past with technology now and rehab process. He can beat this and come back even stronger next year. So all we have to do is hope you know he comes back and attacks his rehab and uh, stays on schedule we have a great show planned for you guys today we have a guest that's going to give us some insight on the la chargers of course broncos traveling to take on the chargers this coming week where they won last year we're going to introduce him here in just a few minutes we're going to talk about the flurry of roster moves the broncos made in the wake of the bradley chubb injury but first just a couple of quick matters of business you guys make sure you're following the show on twitter at Huddle Up Pod. That is the best way for you to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time. Also, a reminder to get on Apple Podcasts, leave us a creative review, and if you like what you hear, give us a five-star rating because that is one of the best ways that you can support the show organically. Really goes a long way toward helping Zach and myself and the other guys on the podcast. So take care of that. And it also enters you into the drawing that we give away some Mile High Huddle Huddle Up podcast swag at the end of each month. So take care of that. And then a reminder to our YouTube audience, and even those of you who don't maybe listen via uh, YouTube on a week-to-week basis, might give you an incentive. Head on over to YouTube Thursday night, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, because we will be holding our Mile High Mailbag simulcast at that time this is the overtime podcast network all right zach let's get to the the flurry of roster moves the broncos made two additions and then of course chubb goes to ir and then they wave Keyshawn bearia so first and foremost the broncos worked out a bunch of different edge rushers and ultimately settled on jeremiah atachu and he's a guy that most fans should be familiar with the denver broncos saw him twice a year for four years as he was a former second round pick of the Chargers back when they were in San Diego. He had a couple of solid seasons. His kind of breakout year was in 2015. His career total, Zach, in in sacks, he's got 12 of them, 82 combined tackles. But the last couple of years, he's kind of floated around. His most recent team, of course, he was cut by the Kansas City Chiefs. He's 6'3", he's 252 pounds, so he's got good size. But how do you see this affecting the Broncos' pass rush moving forward? Well, I, I can't say that I'm intimately familiar with the tattoo, but all I can remember is watching with the Chargers. He was a, a pretty decent pass rusher. He's not a starting caliber player. He's not a pro bowler by any means, but it's going to be a committee approach between him, Malik Reed, Justin Hollins. And between those three, you have to feel comfortable that they can at least – come close to matching what Shub can bring to the table. Obviously, they don't have his skill set, but but as a collective, I think they can get by with him opposite Von Miller. I like the signing. I think it's better than going for a retread, better than bringing back you know, Dakota Watson or Jeff Holland, bringing in some fresh blood, and also the fact bringing in a guy who played for a team you're about to play on Sunday. It's a little bit of a competitive advantage there. I like the way that we're thinking, at least in that sense. The Broncos also added a new offensive tackle fellow by the name of Calvin Anderson. He was He's an undrafted rookie. He was on the New York Jets practice squad. Actually, I'm not sure if he's undrafted. Um, let me check that real quick. Let me double check that here. Signed, yeah, college free agent. So an undrafted rookie out of Texas, a tackle. Interesting that that's one of the moves the Broncos chose to make after they had also waived Keyshawn Bieria. So Chubb goes to IR, Keyshawn Bieria waived. That leaves two open roster spots, Atachu and Anderson, your thoughts on the Broncos adding what appears to be another tackle project. Does that 
imply maybe that Juwan James is still behind the eight ball? It could be, or the or they're very you know tenuous in confidence with Garrett Bowles, which is you know def- definitely justified, even though he's played better. But I like this. I've been pushing for it for a while now. I know you have too, Chad. Bringing in some fresh blood here and giving Munchak a new tackle prospect, it literally can't hurt them. It can only help if they find a gem in Anderson. He can maybe be a pinch starter. He can play along the line. They need those guys to develop because aside from Elijah Wilkinson, they have no one behind Bowles and Juwan James, two very very shaky starters. Let's get to the Denver Broncos practice report. Speaking of the injured Juwan James, other guys we need to get to here. The Broncos practiced, of course, on Wednesday. A couple of guys did not practice. That included Bryce Callahan, Josie Jewell. But there were a few guys who were limited, which gives us some optimism that they might be able to participate on Sunday against the Chargers. Those who were limited included Kareem Jackson and Jawan James is practicing in limited form. Ron Leary... Uh, limited. Normally, they they're resting him at least once a week, just kind of a vet rest day with his injury history to his knee and his back. Emmanuel Sanders was limited with a quadricep concern. Derek Wolf was limited with that ankle he sprained the game before last. And then Duke Dawson popped up on the injury report with an ankle, and he practiced in full though. Joe Jones triceps full go, looking like he is going to return to action finally this week against the Chargers and. Couldn't have come soon enough because my dog, Justin Hollins, was absolutely (laughs) atrocious in relief of Josie Jewell last week. Yeah, and if anything, Jones can can provide some special team stability, too. He's pretty good there. The big takeaway from the injury report to me is Juwan James at least getting in a limited practice and uh, working his way back to full health. Kareem Jackson, too, for that matter. And I just want to see, regardless of the result, regardless of the Broncos' record, I would like to see this team play with all their starters and all their free agent additions. Just one game, chat. I want to see this team play with all their, their first stringers and, and see what they can do. And it's encouraging that at least Juwan James, who we thought would have a very severe injury, is coming back You know, at least on schedule if not ahead of schedule yeah I mean we haven't seen the full vision of what John Elway and Vic Fangio had in mind for this team yet I mean all three of the Broncos big free agent acquisitions have missed significant time now and so we haven't really seen this team take shape the way the Broncos ultimately envisioned it Juwan James two series in week one before he left with that knee we haven't seen Bryce Callahan at all and then Kareem Jackson missed last week so compounding that now is Bradley Chubb being gone and you know not having Joe Jones for the first quarter of the season missing Andy Janovich for three of those four games so at the same time and John Elway spoke to this on on KOA I think it was on Tuesday you know that's something that every NFL team has to deal with you have to be able to roll with the punches from an injury perspective and and handle the vagaries of the injury bug And, Zach, that's where some of the disappointment for me comes in because that's where you would expect and hope that a veteran signal caller who has started in the NFL for over 10 years could stabilize, plug some of those leaks, and at least kind of stabilize the team when it's missing some of the players that it really needs to have on the field, kind of elevate guys beyond their their normal ability, and we just haven't seen that happen from Joe Flacco quite yet. He's just not that quarterback. Very few quarterbacks are. A player like Tom Brady, you can have you or I out there catching passes, Chad. He'd make us look like pro bowlers. He's just that good of a quarterback. Patrick Mahomes, he lost Tyree Kill. He lost Kareem Hunt. Still making plays. Joe Flacco is just not that type of quarterback. And he's a replacement level guy. That's why the Ravens got rid of him. That's why they replaced him. He can win if if you have a dominant running game and a dominant defense. If you, any of those things come unglued, like what we've seen the first four weeks, that's what happens the first four weeks. They're 0-4. He's not good enough to carry them. He's not good enough to win on the strength of his shoulder. I mean, we talked about this in detail, but it's just it's just the facts. He hasn't been the reason the Denver Broncos have been losing game after game this year, and he arguably had his best game last week in a losing effort where he went over 300 yards and threw a trio of, of touchdown passes. And But that one interception, I don't know what it was, Zach, it not only did it kill him and cause him to go into a shell for basically a quarter and a half but it literally caused the Denver Broncos as a team as a complete and and entire team to go into a shell and this was something I wrote about and I also made a video about on Wednesday you guys go check it out at milehighhuddle.com that the Broncos if we're really getting down to the the crux of the spiritual crisis the Broncos are in it really comes down to you know having the resilience to bounce back in the face of adversity 
when one thing goes wrong, and this is another thing I always spoke to on that same KOA interview on Tuesday, all it takes at this stage, Zach, this team is so fragile, this team is so sensitive, all it takes is one thing to go off the rails to trigger an avalanche, a snowball effect of bad, right, of things just going wrong. And it's until they can figure out how to overcome that and stop feeling like they are slaves to Murphy's Law, it's going to continue to, when they get into these crunch time moments and something doesn't go perfectly according to plan, they're going to come up short because the reality is, Zach, football is a game of attrition. No team plays a perfect 60 minutes of football week in and week out. But the good teams, when things do go wrong, whether it's a missed assignment, a turnover, a missed tackle, whatever it might be, they find a way to bounce back. It's that short-term memory, and unfortunately the Broncos' memory right now is that of an elephant. They're dwelling in the past. I mean, even the good teams, though, they commit mistakes. Brady throws interceptions. You know, you're going to have mistakes. They're inevitable. It's just the fact that if the Broncos commit one, even not a, a, a monumental mistake, even not an interception, a holding penalty, a false start, something like that, a, a missed assignment on a tackle, a, a blown coverage, it just completely devastates them. And you use going into a shell for Joe Flacco, which is absolutely appropriate, but it's the entire Broncos team. They just don't play with passion or intensity for all four quarters. They're not a battle-tested team. They don't know how to win they don't have an identity and we're all seeing that come out in the wash as you like to say chad and it's true that's why they're 0 four right now they just have nothing they do overly well uh they're a master of none right now and until they have some sort of identity some sort of passion and vigor i i don't see many things changing at all they've just got to stop caving into the losing mentality man that that idea yep. that you know i they they probably won't admit it but on some emotional level it's like they've become okay with losing, and that just can't be something that you you live live you know live with. I guess I should say because if you do, you're going to die. And well, that's what we're seeing week to week. The Broncos currently have the longest active losing streak in the NFL, and it dates back to Week 14 of last year. And you know what that tells me? It's not a Vic Fangio problem. I'm not saying Fangio's not accountable or has responsibility to fix this. I'm just saying it's not a Vic Fangio problem. It's not even necessarily a Vance Joseph problem. It's a spiritual crisis of which the only people who can save this team are the players themselves. That locker room has to find a way to come together. And maybe, Zach, all it'll take is one game, one win, to kind of snap out of this miasmic haze they're under and this spiritual crisis. But they've been close. Two games in which they managed to rest the lead late under one minute to go well under two minutes to go anyway two games out of four and they still found a way to lose those games and it's in those crunch time moments I mean I think back to the 2011 Broncos for example all those Tebow miracle games in which that team went into every game knowing they were outmatched more often than not they went into every game knowing absolutely in the in the depth of their bones that if they could keep it close come crunch time in the fourth quarter it would be them finding a way to win not the opponent, and they brought new meaning to the term winning ugly. I mean, we're talking about a Tim Tebow-led Broncos squad that went on the road to Kansas City and won with him completing two passes the entire game. So we got to get back some of that, that belief in Denver, and they might be able to right the ship eventually. Uh, I'm right there with you in the fact that if they can just get one win, if they can shake the monkey from their back, it can open the floodgates for them to start doing things more consistently, maybe becoming a team with an identity, uh, running a team, uh, a defensive team. But until they do, it's not going to suddenly make them a contender overnight. We have to take things relatively, uh, you know, case by case basis. They can get one win. If they can upset the Chargers, let's say, that will give them some momentum. And I thought it was going to happen against the Jaguars. It can just give them some, some confidence in themselves. They can start playing loose instead of playing tight. We're seeing a very demoralized team, and not that I blame them at 0-4, at 0-3 coming out last week against the Jaguars, but they just don't have that that passion, and, and then losing has really taken its toll for a lot of players in this locker room. Uh, Vic Fangio said today he has a council of all the players that he meets with to get a pulse of the team. They're all veteran players, and they've all, they're all these players that most of them have been around since the, the championship days, and now they've just been losing, losing, losing year after year after year. This locker room is worn down. All it's going to take is one win preferably an upset to just get some of that confidence back they can play more like themselves and by that i mean a good sound defensive team 
a smash mouth running attack, and you complement them with a, a big arm quarterback, Joe Flacco. The same vision that we thought we were going to see in them coming into the season. If they can just shake the, the monkey, get off the schneid, we can see the, the glimpse of what this Broncos team can be. But until that happens, it's just a case of uh, you know wishful thinking. Amen, brother. Amen. Well, hey, we still have to get to our guests. we got to go behind enemy lines. We are going to have ourselves a conversation with Mr. Jason B. Hirschhorn, who covers the Chargers for Sports Illustrated. We're going to get to that on the other side of this one and only break that we're going to take today. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. And now we welcome in the guest for today's show as we go behind enemy lines. He is the beat reporter covering the Chargers for Sports Illustrated. He is Jason B. Hirschhorn. Find him on Twitter at by underscore JBH. Jason, thanks for joining us, my friend. How are you? I'm doing well. Just got back from Costa Mesa and Chargers practice and such. So uh, a lot is going on there at present. You may have heard. Indeed. A lot of moving parts going on. What's what's the state of the team right now? What's the overall vibe covering the Chargers? I mean, the team seems fairly optimistic. And though you can't get anyone to say it on the record, I think it's because they know both this week and next week, they're playing teams that have a combined one win. And that one win is over a team that is itself winless. So that's part of it. But (laughs) Injuries, and I know this will shock you with the the Chargers, injuries have become an issue for the Chargers in 2019 at, at a number of spots on all, literally all sides of the ball, all phases of the, of the game. But right now in particular, there there just aren't that many healthy receivers. And I mean both wideouts and tight ends. I heard that, uh, I thought I had read that Hunter Henry, well, actually, let me go back to the practice report. Did He didn't practice, or did he practice limited on Wednesday? He, he did not practice. He, however, was in the locker room. We were able to see him sort of like around the facility, which is not something you could have said about him previously unless you just ran into him in a hallway. So I, I think that's an indication that things are improving. Anthony Lynn said that Henry is getting closer. I don't think that he is likely to play anytime over the next few weeks, and he's is certainly not going to play this weekend. But at some point, maybe before the end of the month, Hunter Henry may be back in there. Though even in that situation, I imagine it's going to be a limited capacity. And Jason, speaking of players that are going to play more, obviously, you know, Melvin Gordon's back from his holdout. But Austin Eckler, Colorado kid's playing really well right now. In this game, do they risk, you know, benching the hot hand and Eckler to go with Gordon? What do you see the split being if there is one, a committee approach? Do they go back to giving uh, Gordon the workhorse role? How do you think they're going to attack the Broncos defense on the ground with those two great running backs this week? Well, eventually, I do think it's going to be Melvin Gordon taking somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of the snaps at running back. But this is a team that, at least under Anthony Lynn and with uh, Ken Wisenhunt as the offensive coordinator, has used a tandem at the at the top of its offense. So Eckler's role is not going to disappear, even though it will eventually diminish as Melvin Gordon's workload in, or increases. This week, I think it's going to be closer to a 50-50 split. Part of it is because Eckler's playing so well, and also simply because, as we discussed earlier, there just aren't that many receiving threats healthy for the Chargers. Austin Eckler actually is one of those guys. He's number two on the team in both receptions and receiving yards. He's tied with Keenan Allen for receiving touchdowns. He's a real big part of the passing game, not just the running game. So they almost can't risk reducing his workload that much simply because of what he provides in that role. Gordon is going to see reps, or see snaps rather, and he may end up seeing more carries than Austin Eckler, but I would expect in terms of just snap count that Eckler and Gordon are going to be pretty close as long as they're both healthy. Jason, I thought it was interesting on Wednesday in his conference call, Philip Rivers was asked about how the Chargers started 0-4 in 2017 and went on to kind of turn it around and finish 9-7 and that year. And in his remarks on the topic answering the question, he basically intimated anyway that he believes the Denver Broncos are a team better than their 0 and 4 record would suggest. He's thinking, you know, maybe they could they could just as easily be 2 and 2. Do you think that's just lip service trying to be the class act that Philip Rivers is and not give him, you know, the Broncos any bulletin board material or do you think that's really the vibe or at least the view in that Chargers locker room that hey, look, they're 0 and 4, they're they're kind of down and out, but this is a team that is better than their record would suggest? 
Well, keep in mind, it's actually not just Philip Rivers saying this. This is something that Anthony Lynn, the head coach, has also repeated. He repeated today during his press conference. And if you've watched the games, and I'm sure your audience knows, that's pretty true. You know, if not for a miracle timeout and at least a questionable roughing the passer penalty (laughs) at the end of that game against the Bears in week two, that's a win. I mean, most of these games have been very close. So it is not an exaggeration to say that the Broncos are performing better than their record. At the same time, this is not the typical Broncos performance we've seen, at least on the defense. I mean, it's not even just the the lack of pressures that we saw, at least until last week. I mean, that, that defense is not functioning at the level that we've seen it. So I, I do think it's a little bit both ways. I do think Rivers and at least the leadership of that team are taking the Broncos seriously. And it's not just because of the players that they've seen in Denver for so many years now. I think a lot of those guys have dealt with Vic Fangio in the past and know that even though his defense has not played at a high level thus far in 2019, that it's it's something that will eventually turn around because that's the quality of defensive corner or defensive mind that he's been. Now, I want to take it back to Rivers for a second. Obviously, a lot of Broncos fans hate the guy, talks a lot of trash. I happen to think he's one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. Love his game. Looking over his stats right here, seven touchdowns, two picks, 1,254 yards, rating of just under 106. Seems like he's playing really well in his age uh, 37 season, 16th year. Do you notice any downturn in Rivers' game, or is he playing still on a what I believe is, is an elite level in the NFL? I think he's still playing at as high of a level as he ever has. Now, if you look at just the numbers, they're not too far off of his career highs, but they are slightly lower, at least in most cases. I think he's actually completing close to 70% of his passes, and if he maintains that, that'd be one of the highest completion percentages he's had in his career. But you have to keep in mind the context. This is an offense that has not had its prefer- its five preferred starters for any game this season, and might not, depending on what happens with Russell Okung, who's uh, going to return, or he's trying to return from a pulmonary embolism that he suffered back in June. And then you look at the receiving cards we just talked about, and then, you know, in the backfield, I mean, Melvin Gordon has yet to play a snap this season. Justin Jackson, who wasn't the starting running back in Gordon's absence, but had seen a lot of work, and was leading the NFL in yards per carry at the time of his calf injury, you know, he's not going to play this week, at least it doesn't seem like he's going to. And these, these are big losses. When you have that moving parts over the course of an entire quarter of the season, it's going to negatively affect your offense. And, and the Chargers have, even though they haven't put up a ton of points, they've remained very efficient. And Rivers has been obviously a very big part of that. And for whatever reason, this seems to be the year that Rivers has, I don't, I don't know, engaged his legs more than you'd expect. He's never been a fleet of foot quarterback, and he doesn't look pretty when he runs. But he has been more willing to scramble and extend plays out of the pocket. He he did a very good job of that this past week. Uh, His touchdown to Austin Eckler was the result of him scrambling and buying time and doing like a sidearm or even more of a sidearm delivery than normal, getting into Eckler for about a 12-yard gain in touchdown. He had a similar play with Tremaine Pope, one of the other backup running backs. And Rivers is playing, I would say, all things considered, at about as high a level as we've seen him. What's the situation at inside linebacker? I know Denzel Perryman is on the injury report. Thomas Davis, a a transplant on the injury report. The Broncos, you know, if if they've established any kind of an identity on offense, it's been as a ground-and-pound type of take your shots but pound it between the tackles type of, of offense. What's the inside linebacker situation looking like right now for the Chargers? Well, right now, Denzel Perryman is the starter and is seeing most of the reps. That was not the case early on, not because Perryman wasn't viewed as the starter, but simply because he was coming back from an ankle injury. Even though he was active, the team was intentionally limiting his snaps from scrimmage. That's changed. He's good to go. He left last week's game briefly to be evaluated for a concussion. Ultimately, the uh, independent neurologist ruled that he had not suffered one, so he's a full go, at least as far as we know this week, unless something else pops up. So, so that's the main guy that the Broncos will have to concern themselves with in terms of the linebacking group. Uh, Thomas Davis, as you mentioned, also a big part of this. He's new to the defense, but I mean, he's played so much football. He's the old, I believe, the oldest player on the team, the most experienced player on the team. And he's a, he's a big part of what they are trying to do, both in the run and in the pass game. I mean, they use him in both roles. Uh, it's not a great defense because of all of the injuries there, too. And we haven't even discussed Derwin James, who it will at least miss the first half of the season with a broken foot. Right. Their other starting safety, or at least their other, what they actually like to play three safeties in their base defense. But their other main safety, Adrian Phillips, 
broke his arm a couple of weeks ago, so he he's going to be out for the foreseeable future. And that leaves them with Rayshon Jenkins and a bunch of guys who really have not played a lot of football even as of today. Uh, and that's a big part of their defensive problem. So even even though the Broncos have not played well defensively, this is a matchup in which they can get on track. Uh, Jason, speaking of linebackers, the Broncos just signed Jerry Attachu, who began his career in you know with the Chargers the first couple, four years of his career. What's a he's not going to be a starter; he's going to be kind of a pinch hitter, filling in for Bradley Chubb in a rotation. But what's kind of a scouting report you can give Broncos fans about Attachu as a as a pass rushing outside linebacker? He's a really interesting player. At least he was coming out of Georgia Tech because he was one of the most athletic players amongst the pass rushers in that draft class, and. You can still see that athleticism in him. It just doesn't seem to translate as a pass rusher. Doesn't mean he's a, he's a useless player. I mean, he he has made big plays at times, and he he is more useful than I think at least the the pure like coverage stats would suggest in coverage. But he, he's just not a guy who I think any team is going to want to play more than a handful of snaps from scrimmage. He's someone that could be very impactful on special teams, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Broncos get him involved in that capacity at some point. But from scrimmage, he. He's still a guy who's very, very promising and just hasn't manifested that athleticism into results yet. I wanted to also ask you, Jason, about how this draft class is hanging in there. I noticed Nasir Adderley, the second-round pick, the safety out of Delaware. He's on the injury report. You got Jerry Tillery was the first-round pick, Trey Pipkins, Drew Tranquil. How's the 2019 draft class chipping in so far through the first quarter of the season? Well, they're not really contributing all that much, if we're being honest at this point. Jerry Tillery will probably contribute a lot more going forward because Melvin Ingram is going to miss. It, it seems like at least this week, probably two weeks. Ingram looks pretty normal in the locker room, walking around like he has a hamstring injury, but you wouldn't really know it. So perhaps they're just taking a, a very cautious approach with him. But either way, while he's out, Tillery's going to have to pick up some of the slack. They don't play the exact same position, but Tillery was brought into Los Angeles to be a pass rusher. That's what he did at Notre Dame. I think they see him as, at least down the line, someone who could play sort of like Chris Jones with the Chiefs does. He's a very similar body type, but he just hasn't really done that much yet. Nasir Adderley, he had a really late start to his training camp in preseason, and that's part of the reason that he hasn't played a lot thus far in 2019. I think at some point that'll change once he, he's more in the groove. But, I mean, he's also a player coming from Delaware. I mean, it's a big jump from that to the NFL. So even if he's you know fully healthy and has many weeks in the system, it might be a guy that's not going to be ready until 2020 or beyond. And then if you look at the guys beyond that, I mean, there really have not been many contributions. Trey Pipkins at one point was in position to compete for one of the starting tackle jobs. That very quickly deteriorated for him. Uh, and the guys you know, that were drafted on day three, they just really haven't made that much of an impact from scrimmage. So it doesn't mean this draft class is going to produce good players. I mean, Tom Telesco has a, a pretty good track record of drafting guys at least in terms of the top of the draft, but it doesn't seem like this is going to be a typical draft class where one, two, maybe even three of those guys contribute a lot as rookies. Jason, I know that not many people are giving the Broncos much of a chance of winning this game. It's, it's going to be an uphill battle for them to come out victorious and spring the upset. But if the Chargers do end up losing this game, what is one reason you think that would contribute to that? What's the main reason if the Chargers do lose, uh, that would be the case for that? And conversely, if they do win, uh, what's to be the strength of them in this game? What do you think is their game plan uh, to attack this Broncos defense and their offense on Sunday? Well, to answer the, the first part of that, it, it's going to be because the Broncos' pass defense was good enough to slow down this injury-riddled Chargers offense. Now, it's not just that they have very few healthy, experienced receivers available. It's also that that Chargers offensive line has not performed consistently well this season. And, and they certainly have not performed as well pass-protecting as they have against the run. So we have a situation where Rivers is not going to get a ton of time and the receivers are, or at least the receiving core is diminished, that's a scenario where the Broncos could have an advantage. And obviously, they, they lost Bradley Chubb to an ACL injury, so it's not going to be that, that full allotment of weapons on defense that they're used to having. But Von Miller, even though the numbers may not suggest it, is still Von Miller. He still has all of those moves. I don't think he's diminished physically at all, and I think in time that will come as he adjusts to Vic Fangio's defense. And the secondary, at least in terms of the cornerbacks, still has a lot of talent there, at least a lot of players that the Chargers seem to be worried about. So if those two, two things can combine to slow down the Chargers' passing attack, the, the running game 
it has not thus far really been the breakout star of that Chargers offense. Maybe that changes with Gordon. Maybe this is in some way the perfect time for Melvin Gordon to get back into the flow of things. But I think if you slow down the Chargers offense, you have a good chance of winning. And the Broncos, just because of the personnel they have and the personnel that the Chargers don't have, can take advantage there. Uh, In terms of what a Chargers victory looks like, I think it's just a combination of getting enough out of the passing game, getting Gordon working again, and just not having any big, big mistakes on defense, which is a lot to ask for, especially considering, again, all of those injuries that they have. But the Broncos have not taken advantage of a ton of opportunities thus far this season. I, I've seen the game against the Bears in full. I've seen the game against the Packers in full. And whether it's an offense or defense, there seems to be these opportunities that are there, like it, you know, in that offense in particular, where a receiver will open up and Flacco will just miss him wide or deep. Yeah. And the, they definitely have to take advantage, hit on those plays if they're going to have a chance against the Chargers, especially in Los Angeles as opposed to Denver. All right, last question for you, Jason. Last year, obviously, the Broncos went in as massive underdogs and beat the Chargers at home. Kind of a different complexion to this season. Doesn't mean it can't happen again for our Broncos fans listening to this show. But as a prediction, what do you see? It might be a little early in the week for this. I don't know how you typically do this, but our listeners are going to want to know how you see this game unfolding. Who you got winning this thing? I think in the most typical Chargers fashion, they will establish a slight first half lead as they have in literally every game this season. And it will either come very close to being a blown lead by the end of the game, or they will, in fact, actually blow it. I think ultimately the Chargers are going to emerge with a victory simply because even though the Broncos remain very talented, at least much more talented than their record suggests, I still think they're adjusting to that Vic Fangio defense. And we have seen this in some of Fangio's other stops. When when he first arrived in Chicago, that was not a great defense, even though it's had some pretty good, at least field-tilting players. I think the the Broncos are just part of that, or going through that process right now, where they have the talent, at least a pretty good allotment of talent, and they're just figuring out how to go from the defense that they played in for many years and the one they're now dealing with with Vic Fangio. It will eventually come together because Fangio is just slow, so clever. He finds ways to produce a ton of pressure, even when he's not blitzing a lot. And he very rarely blitzes, as I'm sure you know. I think in time, they will figure it out. I just don't know if they're going to figure it out this week or maybe in, in the coming weeks. I think by the end of 2019, it's going to look very different unless they have just a you know another spate of injuries. But yeah, right now, this is a good time for any team to run into the Broncos. And that's why I think the Chargers ultimately end up with a W here. He is Jason B. Hirshhorn. He covers the Chargers for Sports Illustrated. Find him on Twitter at by underscore JBH. Jason, we'll have to get you back on again later in the season when these two teams meet again. It's been a true pleasure talking with you. Thanks for joining us. Looking forward to it, guys. This is the Overtime Podcast Network. All right, Zach, great conversation with Jason. Oh, yeah. Bottom line here. The Chargers, you know, they haven't exactly played up to snuff to open this this year, but that's kind of the model that it's been in at least the second half of the Phillip Rivers era with the Chargers is they kind of get out to slow starts, find their groove, find their rhythm, get their legs underneath them, and then that second half of the season they're typically a force to be reckoned with. And it's all because they have that quarterback under center who they can win by, who makes them a better team, who can overcome mistakes. And it's the kind of antithesis of the Broncos right now, Phillip Rivers. He's continually a thorn on the Broncos' side. He's continually, I think, an elite quarterback. And as long as they have him, they have a good, well-coached team with Anthony Lynn, a strong running game, a good, sound defense. As long as they have those pieces in place, they're going to push in the AFC West, and they're going to be a tough out for the Broncos in starting this Sunday. All right, you guys. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode of the Huddle Up Podcast. Make sure you follow Jason on Twitter. You're going to see his team twice a year. So he's a good guy to keep a beat on for updates on this AFC West divisional foe at BY underscore JBH. At BY underscore JBH. Make sure you're following the show on Twitter at Huddle Up Pod. You can find my partner, Zach Kelberman, here on Twitter at Kelberman NFL. Myself, at Chad and Jensen. Stay tuned. We will be back tomorrow. And this is a reminder for those of you who want to participate in the YouTube live session, the simulcast we're going to do Thursday for the Mile High Mailbag. Go over to YouTube, search Mile High Huddle, subscribe. You'll be locked in. You'll be notified when we go live. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll talk to you then. You've been listening to the Huddle Up Podcast. 
Join Broncos Country's deep divers at milehighhuddle.com to keep the conversation going.